Dann sind wir auch schon beim letzten äh, Vortrag für den Vormittagstrack und ich darf äh, Herrn Thomas Wagner hier bei mir begrüßen. Herr Thomas Wagner ist, das muss ich jetzt ablesen, am Collaborating Center for Sustainable Consumption and Production und verantwortet dort eben äh, Projekte im Bereich Sustainable Business und Entrepreneurship, ähm, entwickelt auch äh, Nachhaltigkeitsstrategien für Organisationen, forscht aber eben auch ähm, um, äh, im Bereich innovative Geschäftsmodelle und welchen Beitrag sie eben lassen zur nachhaltigen Wirtschaft. Und dazu gehören natürlich auch Sharing-Organisationen äh, und äh, seine Ergebnisse. Hierzu wird er uns jetzt vorstellen. Vielen Dank. Yeah, so thank you very much for introducing myself. Let's see where the says. Yeah. So I work at the CSCP, and I'm very happy that you uh, that you spoke out the com complicated name, so I don't have to speak it out again. Uh, we were founded in 2005 by UNEP, so it's the United Nations Environmental Program, and the Wuppertal Institute, which I think most of you know, and we have the with the goal to transfer research insights into practices into the practice, so we're a think and do tank, we're non-profit, and we have a very international scope, but also work on a local and national level. We have three teams, all together working with the goal to mainstream sustainable lifestyles. So on the one hand, we have the product services and infrastructure team, so they work a lot on product level, they work on policy level, but they also, um, for example, work with cities, so for example, there are projects on asking the question, how can a sustainable city in 2030 look like and engage in visioning processes with cities. Then we have the sustainable lifestyles team exactly, um, which look into habits and behaviors. They look into what are the framework conditions um, which make us engage into certain behavioral patterns or consumption patterns. And then we have the SPE team, that's the team where I work. And so that's the sustainable business and entrepreneurship team. We work a lot with businesses, but we also look a lot into new business models. We look into entrepre entrepreneurship. We work with startups as well. And having looked into different business models, new business models, which enable people to live or potentially could enable people to live more sustainable lifestyles. We also looked, started looking into the sharing economy, of course. So this has brought us to engaging in a report called Listening to Sharing Economy Initiatives, which I want to present today, and I'm gonna present the results of this. And then also I wanna to present today the ongoing research which we're conducting. So we're also part of a BMBF project, so also under the, under the um, ZERF research stream, um, as well as the iShare and uh, peer sharing uh, projects are. And it's a project which is called ILONA. It's a very beautiful name. Um, it stands for Innovative Logistics for Sustainable Lifestyles. And here the sharing economy also plays a part because it's a potential solution. It definitely, it, it, we look at it, at it as a factor for en en enabling sustainable consumption patterns related to logistics. So some background information on this survey um, called Listening to Sharing Economy Initiatives. Do you also hear me w when I talk like this or only when I go closer? Okay, <laughs> nice. Um, yes, uh, so we conducted a global survey together with two partners, uh, not together, with five partners all together. And, and let's start like this. Uh, so it was the CCP, the Akatu Institute from Brazil, the Columbia Business School from the US, and as outreach partners, we had WeShare and Shareable. So our goal was to get a better understanding of the initiatives themselves. So I think today here in the, in the different, um, different presentations, uh, we've seen the overall picture of the sharing economy. We've also seen a lot on peer-to-peer uh, -peer sharing platforms, uh, the research which is going on there. We've seen on social innovation. Uh, so I think it fits pretty well that here we cover the part of an empirical survey on sharing economy initiatives. We wanted to better understand their business models. We wanted to better understand what are their needs, what are their demands, how they finance themselves, and what are their challenges, um, but also what are their further prospects, what potential do they see in the sharing economy, and what can we then deduct from this for our further, further research and work on this. So we conducted an online survey, um, which ran from March to June 2014, and then we enhanced this with six expert interviews for interpreting the results. So 
Altogether, the report focuses on uh, quite a lot of stuff. It looks at what are the characteristics of the consumers. So how do the initiatives themselves see the consumers? What value do they see which they provide to society and to their consumers? What are the main challenges which sharing economy initiatives face? What is the importance of trust? So creating trust by, between users, but also between the initiatives and the users. Do the companies look into scaling up? As we know, many of them are startups, so most of them, yes, do look into scaling up. What's the relevance? What, do, what dimensions do they look into when they scale up? And then we also ask them, of course, what additional support do they need? What partnerships would they want to engage in? And from this also deducting further opportunities for the sharing economy. So today I'm not going to focus, um, not, I'm not going to go into depth into all of these. Uh, for this you would have to read the report, of course. Uh, I'm going to make a short summary and highlight the most interesting results and interpretations. So first of all, a little background to gain a better understanding um, who we talked to, so who we surveyed, uh, in order to also then interpret the results. So I think uh, which might also go in line with the peer sharing project is that most of the initiatives we surveyed are P2P, offer P2P sharing services. Some of them also B2B services, even though we then looked further into the data and saw that many of the B2B also offer P2P, so they're, they're platforms um, which are for multiple, um, oh no, sorry, not the B2B, many of the B2C also offer B2, uh, P2P services. Most of the companies come from Europe, many or quite some from the US, some from Latin America. So as you can also see from this data, this is not completely representative. Um, so it was also not a three year research project. It was a, um, yeah, a project which we conducted over the course of, I think, four to six months, but we wanted to still gain a first initial understanding of those initiatives. Over 90% of the, uh, of the initiatives offer online platforms and only 8% um, operate only offline. We're surprised to see that 80% of them are for profit, only 20% are non profit, and roughly 80% also consider themselves as startups, which is also not surprising because, as we just seen from the presentation of Mr. Scholl, um, many sharing economy initiatives have been founded within the past five years. One thing to also point out is that we had as outreach partners Shareable and WeShare, and they both focus very much on grassroots and on local initiatives. So this is also always has to be in the back of the mind when interpreting the data. So getting into the results of the survey, um, first of all, we asked the questions, what do you focus on? And here we saw very little surprise. I think um, most of us know that most sharing economy cities focus on but also thrive either in mega cities or in, well, in cities at least. And the rural space is not a focus area for sharing economy initiatives. <coughs> then we looked into what is the age group that they focus on. And here we see that the largest age group which sharing economy initiatives focus on is between 20, 35. Then also 35 to 50 still gets a lot of attention. And then the so-called elderly, so the, the older that the target group gets, the less attention they get from sharing economy initiatives. And this is very interesting because, so we really ask, who do you aim for? We, we didn't ask, who are your users? And when you ask the question, who do you aim for? Who do you target? You also understand that's the way that they then also design their offer. That's the way they also design their marketing. And that's who they really go for. So it's important to see that even so the sharing economy initiatives themselves don't, don't that much see an elderly generation, an aging population as a potential target group for their businesses. And they don't aim that much at reaching out to these, uh, to these potential, potential users. We also asked for the characteristics which they see. So that, uh, most, of them see their, uh, most of them see their users as socially concerned. We're surprised to see the high uh, high focus on price sensitivity, which they, which they attribute to their users. Then, of course, knowledgeable and technologies. That's uh, it's quite intuitive because most platforms are online based, so you need a knowledge in technologies. And we're surprised to see the low emphasis or the low characteristic which they attribute to environmental concerns of their users, and I'll get to speak of this later on and again. 
But just so sort of short summary, looking at this, we already see that the an elderly generation, a rural population, is not targeted very much by sharing economy initiatives. And we see that there's a lot of potential with, which lies in this. Because, for example, in the rural area, you also, for, so for example, in, in many, in many um, many villages, the public transport system is not working so well, so it doesn't provide the, it doesn't provide the society with, with all the needs that they have. So of course there's a huge, there would be a huge potential for sharing economy in initiatives, but yet it's not so much on the radar of them yet. So the next question we asked again was the environmental, uh, was the value proposition which the sharing economy initiatives um, see that they provide to society and to their customers. And here we see that the highest what they see is offering an alternative approach to the prevailing consumer mindset. So of course, for the past 15 years, you know, we have been, um, we have been taught that, or basically not taught, but we've been in a society where consumption is a lot on, based on the ideas of possessing, uh, possessing goods, using them, and when the use phase is over, when there's no need for them, just discarding them. And here the sharing economy offers an alternative approach to this prevalent <laughs> consumer mindset. It increases social connection, better cost effectiveness, of course, which also goes in line with before that they attribute um, a high price sensitivity to the users. But here again, we're surprised to see that the environmental, uh, environmental value proposition actually ranks lowest amongst the values which they see that they provide to their customers. And here again, it's interesting thinking about this from the point of view that what the company sees themselves as providing to their customers is also what they will emphasize on, again, in their marketing, also in their dialogue with the consumers, but also maybe in developing their business model. And if they themselves see that the environmental value proposition ranks so low among, among the hierarchy of values which they offer, uh, which they offer to their users, it maybe also indicates that they don't see it as such a great potential for further looking into this into the future. So we also asked um, whether they measure um, environmental, social, or economic impacts of their, um, of their initiatives, of their organizations. And here it's also a little surprise that most of them don't measure it. Also, the least of them measure the environmental impact, which is also reasonable because the environmental impact, it is very difficult to measure. And then especially when you're a startup, you have a thousand other things to think about than measuring your, your environmental impact. But then on the other hand, a lot of potential is being lost with this because I think we're all very interested in further assessing environmental sustainability potentials of the sharing economy. And as long as we don't have this data and as long as it's not on the radar of the initiatives themselves, we're gonna be a long way from getting there, from actually really harvesting the potential for sustainability of sharing economy initiatives. So um, just maybe because you're wondering because why I'm switching those slides. So we always have citations from the expert interviews, but because there's only 30 minutes left today, I'm going to have to skip these. Um, but they're always highlighted broadly in, in the report. And I think in some parts, they're quite interesting. And I tried to bring them into, into this conversation right now. So we also asked the companies, what are the challenges, or the initiatives we asked them, what are the challenges which you see to your business model or to your operations at the very moment? And there we see that the establishment, establishment of a critical mass is the highest, um, yeah, is the, high, the, the biggest challenge, the biggest barrier which they face us at the moment, together with changing habits and consumer mindsets. Those two are interlinked, of course. So looking at this barrier or this challenge of establishing a critical mass, you can also see why most platforms go focus on cities because there you have a much more condensed population which would potentially use sharing economy platforms. And as Mr. Scholl also pointed out before, these are online platforms which need a network effect. They need a certain amount of demand and of supply in order to function well. Otherwise, the platforms will be abandoned at some point. Changing consumers' habits and behaviors, I think it's very interesting, so I was also very happy to, to hear your presentation and happy to hear that there's gonna be ongoing research on this because that is exactly the point. 
the sharing economy, like for the past couple of years, it was it was cool. Like it was fancy, it was cool, it was like sexy to some point. Um, when you talked about, yeah, you know, I'm using Airbnb, that's that's really fancy. You can tell about your friends. But a very interesting uh, quote we got from Albert Canier Goral, who works for Wisha in Spain. I think maybe some of you know him. He said, you know, sharing economy needs to be normal rather than cool. And I think that's also what Ms. Yega Erben just said in her presentation that we need to find out how can how we can make this be routines in their daily in the daily lives of people, in a normal day to day life that you use sharing economy approaches. Of course, I have to put in brackets that you use the you know sustainability enabling sharing economy approaches because of course you also know that there are a lot of sharing economy um, models which are not more like which don't enhance the sustainable lifestyle. Um, but anyway, from the point of view of sharing economy initiatives, of course it would be important to make this more a habit of behavior than an exception. Another challenge is the establishment of trust between users, but I'm not gonna go into detail too much about this because I think it's been covered in research and in speeches a lot in, in the past couple of years. As many of the initiatives are startups, we asked them, uh, we also wanted to look at the relevance of scaling up. So we asked them, have you scaled up already or are you planning to scale up quite soon? Um, we found a really very, very high positive result. So 31 of the initiatives say, yes, they, um, they've already scaled up. 45% of the initiatives plan to scale up. So that's really um, a very, very high percentage. And then we looked into in what dimensions are you planning or have you scaled up already? What would be the dimensions of scaling up? And we thought it was interesting to find that most of the companies are really saying we want to scale up by expanding across countries. We want to move operations across countries. This can be, of course, explained by the fact that as these are online platforms, moving your operations to another country is related to quite relatively low cost. So you don't have to build up physical capacities. Maybe you don't even have to rent office space in another country. So it's quite intuitive that companies are interested in expanding to other countries, uh, that initiatives are interested in expanding to other countries. And it also brought up this, this other thought in inter interpretations and also in the talks with the experts um, that they say sharing economy initiatives are very pushy, they're very entrepreneurial when they expand, because what they do is they sometimes expand the, uh, they expand the business model to another country or to another city before even knowing where the, their business model is in line with the legal and with the regulation in that country. So I think we've all known the, we, we've all known the examples of Uber, we know the examples of Airbnb, and Looking at it just with, without judging, without judging just from, um, an, like from, from a point of view of analyzing the entrepreneurial spirit in it, it's very interesting to see how Airbnb goes from country to country and then from city to city. First of all, they establish their business model in the cities or in the, in the new countries. And then they really engage in talks with city people, they engage in talks with the regulators, with the people who shape the, who shape the legal framework, and engage in talks to them, and basically also really teach them about the sharing economy. This is, it's actually fascinating. And by this, they're really clearing the pathway also for other sharing economy companies then to build up in these countries. So there's a lot of, yeah, there's really a lot of negotiation and, and learning processes happening right now between sharing economy initiatives and regulators and, and the, whole, the whole legal side, which is quite interesting. Then we have a few less, less, surprising, uh, less surprising results, so scaling up in market share, expanding across regions. And then we have another result, which we thought was quite interesting, is that there's quite relatively low priority on reaching out to new target groups when the companies expand and when they scale up. And if you go back to, if we go back to the, the beginning of the presentation of the results, um, saying that many of the sharing economy initiatives do have a quite clearly identified target group right now, uh, or for example, also completely leaving out an elderly generation. Here you can also see that when they then think about, okay, how can we 
scale up our business model, they apparently don't consider very much saying, okay, let's also try to find ways how we open our services to another target group which we haven't reached yet. It's quite interesting because it also shows that maybe there's also potential to engage in maybe also like learning processes with the initiatives or opening their horizon to saying, okay, how can you tailor your business model? How can you um, expand your business model, your offerings to target groups which you haven't reached yet? Then we asked the companies how they finance their initiatives and also here, as you said, many of them are startups, um, so it's not surprising to see that 70% of them say they, they're self-financed and bootstrapping, but only 16% of the initiatives finance their business model via revenue streams. So that's a very, very, very low margin. Um, this can, of course, also be explained that at the beginning, when, you, when, they, when initiatives open their platforms, so we have to remember they are, it's mostly P2P platforms, mostly online platforms. When they start the initiatives, the first goal is we need to attract a lot of people to our platform. We need to reach those critical mass for a platform to actually really take off. So what do you do? You make it for free. You, you, don't, yeah, you don't incur any price to your users. So you sort of self-finance your platform from savings, you know, maybe from donations or also from government or other funding grants. And after a while you see, okay, now we have to find out how do we generate revenue streams. And it's interesting to see, or it would be interesting maybe also in further research to really and see what did or what do the successful platforms make do different than the platforms which didn't succeed. Because over the past of years, there have been so many sharing economy platforms. So you've just also mentioned friends who you said that it's not so act they're not so active anymore. Um, what are the what are the business model differences between the different initiatives that work and that don't work, and how can you then give advice to, to sharing economy platforms, how to, for example, also like how can you give incentives to users after a while to have a willingness to pay and to lower this price sensitivity? We asked them for the barriers to scaling up um, the initiatives, and yeah, as we said, it's interesting to see, first of all, in the overall challenges to the business model at the beginning, they say, the overall challenges were more on the consumer, on the user side, creating the critical mass, changing consumer mindsets and behaviors. And now we see this switched around. We say, okay, when they think about scaling up, when they think about expanding, it's a lot about generating reliable revenue streams. Already see it is a big challenge. Finding financial support for scaling up. So maybe also getting, for investors, getting a better understanding um, from investors of their business model, of what the sharing economy is, of the potential in it. And then again, you, you still see the difficulty in changing consumers' mindset and behaviors and also finding the right partners. Coming from this, um, we looked into what would, be, um, what would be potential support solutions which the sharing economy, oh, excuse me. Um, yeah, sure. I mean, it's okay. Yeah. Uh, so, as we were mentioned several times now, uh, friends, um, <laughs> Sorry. I, think that, I think one of the problems is that many of the people, uh, many of the platforms only solve problems that nobody has. And that's what we did. <laughs> we solved the problem that was not existing. And that's why also this difficulty in changing uh, consumers' habits and behaviors, yeah, sure. But the platform itself does, should not s change uh, or uh, set out to change a uh, uh, consumer's habit or behavior. They need to solve a problem. If there is no problem that's seen by the consumer, then the habits will not change. If the consumer doesn't see any benefit from using a platform, then the habit will not change. Mm -hmm. So I, as a platform, cannot force anybody to change his behavior. Okay. I think that's it's what a... What we, we made as a, uh, an error, so there's several, so as a staff platform, that's one of the problems. The problems are too little, too small, the transaction value is too little to actually make that work. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for the, for the comment. Uh, I think by this we could start a huge discussion, which 
I'm highly interested in um, because it also links to what you said. You also talked about social innovations need to solve problems, but then there's the whole other aspect. Maybe the, maybe they, we also have a societal problem of our values and of our understanding of consumption patterns. And maybe in 10 years, your platform would solve a problem um, which people now don't see, but in 10 years, then, hmm? Um, yeah, exactly. So, but I'm I'm hesitant to really engage in this discussion right now because I think I, I would still like to. That's unfair. Two minutes ago, it was five minutes left. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay, I'll hurry up. Um, but anyway, okay. So, let's rush it through. Okay, so on support, uh, not surprisingly, marketing and communication is um, a support which many of the companies. Uh, demand, which also goes then into shaping consumer understanding, shaping consumer demands, getting visibility. Um, financial support is very important, as well as new partnerships. Then we went into specifically asking for new partnerships. And there you see the most promising partnerships they see is with other businesses from the sharing economy, which again is intuitive because then it all together helps to shape this consumer mindset. You know, the, so. The more sharing economy initiatives you have, the more you get a societal understanding of it, and the more you make it normal than an exception. Um, we're surprised to see the high willingness of sharing economy initiatives to partner with conventional companies. We thought that's very interesting and can also maybe give an incentive to conventional companies to maybe you know partner up in networks and exchanges. So on the outlook, um, outlook for sharing economy itself, but then also related um, required potential research, uh, we see that we need to identify how, how can we mobilize more target groups, more users for the sharing economy, but also how can we direct the focus of sharing economy initiatives to opening up to further target groups, which they maybe could really provide value to, like an elderly population in an aging, in an, in an aging society. Um, how can it spread to rural areas? I think that's still a very big question um, and very interesting as well. How can we change, and that's where we are, uh, how can we change our consumer behavior and also our culture of, of mass consumption um, so as to see that those, those platforms, yes, do, do, uh, do provide solutions to maybe sort of a problem which we haven't identified yet. Um, identifying new partnerships, I think that's very classical. Legal framework, so for example, sharing city approaches um, where, as Peter is, is engaging in, are very interesting, and I think other cities could take an example in this and in, in engaging in these, in these network of dialogues. Very important is the environmental, uh, social, and economic impacts. How can we assess them? How can we communicate them? But also specifically, how can we push them? And what we also always find very interesting is looking into how can we design products for sharing? Because nowadays, all these products here, all these products that we use in our daily life, they haven't been <laughs> produced for to be used for sharing, but they have mostly been produced to be used or consumed by one person, um, to be discarded at the end of life phase. So maybe um, we have to totally rethink the design of products. And it's very interesting to also, for example, work together with designers. Um, then I quickly, quickly want to uh, then introduce the research project um, called Ilona. Uh, so I just want to say, work on a research project. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so it's a research project analyzing what role does logistics play in sustainability and in enabling sustainable lifestyles. So when you buy a product, there's a whole, obviously, supply and value chain behind that product. So before it comes to the supermarket, or before it comes to the online shop. And there's a big role of logistics service providers that, behind that. But then also asking the question, how does the product get to me or how do I get to the product? What are the sustainability impacts which, um, which happen in that process? What role does logistics play? And what is the consumer awareness for these sustainability impacts? The sharing economy also plays a role here in the research that we do um, because we will look at what solutions or what models of the sharing economy 
actually tackle those different areas. So for example, me getting to the supermarket, I have sharing economy solutions, which might make this consumption process more or less sustainable. So there's car sharing, there's bike sharing, there's uh, in Germany called it Lastenräder, <laughs> uh, which you could potentially use. Um, there's also alternatives to logistics. So for example, Amazon is now looking into a concept called On My Way, where they want to have P2P services um, delivering products to your home. So there's also a sharing economy potentially providing solutions for this. Then of course, there's the alternative consumption. So instead of buying something from a supermarket, I can get it from somebody else. Um, so really sharing models for alternative consumption. And then there's sort of sharing economy approaches in the broader definition of sharing economy, which reduce logistics. So for example, regional food, regional food co-ops. So we'll look into the different models the sharing economy has. We'll look into what, how do they potentially provide solutions for a sustainable lifestyle. Um, so right now we're doing the research. We're going to be, be conducting expert interviews. Uh, so maybe there's some of you in the crowd who I will or already have contacted in order to maybe um, have expert interviews on this topic. And then we're going to have a publication where we yeah, create a model of logistics and sustainable consumption patterns, which is probably going to be produced in March or April. So I'm sorry for uh, going a bit over time. Um, and yeah, thank you very much for the attention. I look forward to a discussion. We don't have that much time for a discussion, but we can just uh, gather two or three comments that you can perhaps um, discuss during the break, if there are some comments or questions. Hi, um, Adrian uh, from yeah, in Berlin, uh, working in different things, including mapping uh, initiatives, also grassroots, which comes very much from the grassroots. I mean, you, you start with the assumption that sharing economy is good, I, I have a feeling. Um, so that I would very much like to know what, is, what are the reasons that justify that uh, assumption. Because there are many uh, people who are very critical, uh, including we've, we've seen some, some bits of, of, of ideas why uh, we should be critical, in particular of big platforms. Yeah. Uh, I, I can quickly answer this because... Uh, I don't, I don't just, no, I mean, like, I definitely do not assume that sharing economy is good or bad per se, but I say there are, it's interesting new business models. They interact with social innovations and with behaviors, and it will be very interesting to see which and how potential they have to enable sustainable lifestyles. But we also look into which potential they have to not do that, you know, for example, rebound effects or... I come to Berlin and instead of public transport, I use the drive now car. It's not sustainable. Um, I didn't, but I'm just an example. <laughs> um, no, so, I, no, so we don't go with that as assumption. Okay, thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you for the questions. Um,